Hello and welcome to the Eco Hour. This is the first of a series of podcasted lectures from the Sociology Department at Maynooth University and is brought to you by myself, Owen Flaherty, I'm a lecturer in sociology here at Maynooth University, Eamon Slater, and Sean Shanahan. So the podcast began um, out of a number of simple ideas. First is that most of us don't really have a lot of time, and we certainly don't have the time we would like to read everything we would like to read. So we thought about this idea of having a series based on social ecological concepts, um, key ideas from social theory, from environmental sociology, from human ecology, um, and a space where we could present these ideas to each other and discuss them, um, ideally within an hour, but as you'll see from this one, uh, we ran slightly over the hour, so it's not quite on the nose. So what we hope is gonna come um, is a series where we discuss uh, a number of concepts, issues, case studies, uh, all relating to the question of humanity and the environment. Um, those some of you listening to this will be interested in ecology, sociology, geography, human or physical perhaps. Um, and this really is aimed at a, at a more generalist audience. Um, so people with a little bit of exposure to social theory, sociology, maybe you're a student, um, an undergraduate or a postgraduate, doesn't really matter. Um, or even if you just got an interest in picking up some new ideas, uh, we hope you enjoy what's going to come. Uh, one thing to note is that what you're going to hear uh, is a presentation with accompanying slides. So if you want to follow along the slides, you can visit our YouTube channel and you can find more information about this at minutuniversity.ie forward slash sociology. Uh, the first in this series then is a lecture from myself on the concept of resilience. So enjoy. I maybe just for format, um, I might present the idea um, in what's pretty much a very, very abstract way. And then we might use the question and discussion to open it up um, to some talk about how we could use it a bit further. Um, I do have an example of how this is applied to my own work, which is on historical uh, food systems and resilience, um, particularly historical instances of famine. So um, depending on how we get through that, I might introduce that a little, but the time might be better spent, I think, talking amongst um, ourselves about the implications of the idea. So what I wanted to address really was the idea behind this uh, seminar, I guess, is about presenting ideas or concepts. And not with a view to sort of defining what we mean definitively uh, by a concept, but to elaborate its intellectual history, to show how contested definitions have emerged, um, how contested applications have emerged, um, how the concept is used in research uh, today, and also how it can help us to make sense of what's going on in the world at the moment. Um, the former three of which are included in this, the latter um, we'll get to in the discussion. So, uh, and I guess I should say as well that this, um, coming from a sociologist, my take on this uh, is as a, as, as, a, as a working sociologist. And my approach to the concept of resilience has been primarily one of how does this help me, um, how does this help me in my analysis of the social world? Um, to be more specific, how does this help in my analysis of historical food systems and how do I understand or how can I understand why some food systems persist, some don't, and what are the factors that contribute to that? And within this, I found the concept of resilience uh, useful. Um, I'll say a bit more about this as we go through, but I guess the first thing to note is that um, resilience doesn't really have a definitive uh, definition, obviously, because it's a very porous term, um, but its application, its appropriation um, is quite varied. Uh, there has been a strain of what we might call, I suppose, a conservative co-opting of the notion of resilience. We hear a lot about resilience as sort of a desirable institutional norm um, it's popping up in human resource management literatures uh, with the sort of sinister implication that um, it's up to you to be resilient and it's not the fault of social context that you're feeling that you're feeling disadvantaged. Um, and I think that's totally fine. That's a really bad use um, of the term and that's not the use I subscribe to. But equally, there is a tendency within uh, the environmental sociology approaches as well um, to take a conservative approach to resilience. And I'm going to suggest as we go through this that there are ways to avoid this. So I guess what I want to do quite quickly is to just elaborate some of the history um, of the concept um, to say how the concept of resilience grew out of, uh, in the mid to late uh, tw 20th century, sorry, how it grew out of uh, the systems theory movement, and then later on how it emerged uh, within a very specific strain of environmental sociology, but not really, kind of more human ecology. So sort of a loose collection of anthropologists, uh, geographers, uh, and economists. So I guess there's a couple of basic definitions that I always go back to in my own work, which is, so what am I trying to do um, and what are the units um, that I need to help me to achieve or to conduct proper analysis? And the couple of things, there's a couple of things that I think appear consistently um, amongst four practitioners like myself that do sort of case studies of social ecological systems. 
um, we're often very concerned with outcomes. Okay, and whenever we talk about resilience, resilience um, in this sense is always linked to a particular outcome. We can talk about population. Okay, population as an outcome then can have many different, many different states. We have in 1970s, in the 1970s, the Club of Rome projections about where human population would be going, and there were different scenarios that were modeled, and there were also different economic and social conditions or configurations of social relations that would allow us to get to that place or place us in one place rather than the other. Um, equally, sociologists use different types of outcome like food security. Does the system persist over time? Yes, no. Does it experience distress? To what extent can we measure or how do we measure distress in food systems? Um, in the political economy literature, we have studies that look at things like regulatory compliance. And again, within that, there's this sort of attention to what are the causal factors at countries that lead to different levels of regulatory compliance, what effect do regulations have on other outcomes, for example, like uh, compliance with emissions, uh, with emissions quotas and stuff like that. Um, the second is about context, and I think this is unique to probably the sociological approach, uh, geographical approach in some senses, is that we spend an awful lot of time looking at context. Now to a human ecologist, context, of course, is primarily environment. Um, now that's kind of being reductionist a little bit, but certainly in the 70s and 80s, uh, in the environment in which this emerged, uh, context really meant environment, the physical environment in which a system was located. Um, and from that, we got all of these literatures like, um, like the ecological footprint approach, which was really just looking at sort of the immediate spatial impact of a geographical unit like a city or so on. But we tend to take a more complex approach to context. When sociologists talk about context, they talk about social context. So what are the predominant social relations of production? What's the mode of production? Is it a capitalist society? What's the mode of governance, government? Is it neoliberal, is it socialist, is it colonial, and so on. And then finally, I'm gonna gloss over these, but of course, units matter. At what level are we talking about resilience? Um, and the resilience approach is difficult in this sense because resilience is talked about as an individual property. And this is probably the, the current strain that we're most familiar with um, in sort of the psychological literature is that resilience is an individual property. It's something we develop through reflexive mindfulness and so on. But the other sense in which we talk about resilience and in which I refer to it is at a geographical level, at a territorial level, or at a systemic level. So at all of these different levels, researchers are inst interested in analyzing or discussing resilience across these different levels, whether it's within a locality, a community, uh, a country, uh, a block, um, or the level of the globe. So I'm gonna outline quickly what I think, and this is by no means definitive, what I think are sort of the main context to the emergence of the concept of resilience, and um, why it needed to emerge when it did, and the deficiencies that it addressed, which I think in many respects are still present uh, in many strains of social theory today. So the first sort of sense in which uh, systems theory makes an appearance um, in social theory, um, and certainly within sort of the, the, formal def the formal discipline of sociology as we understand it, is sort of in the early to mid 20th century. Now there's significant intellectual precursors to that, of course, but around the 1930s, 1940s, we start to see the emergence of sort of a reasonably stable program of systemic social science. And this is based on a collaboration between natural scientists, between social scientists. And I elaborate on this a little bit more in my book, just for a shameless uh, plug. But part of the argument that I make there is that there was a very important time in the mid 20th century when cross-disciplinary dialogue on these issues, although we would look back at this and say this was ridiculously conservative and in many respects it was, but there was a dialogue nonetheless. Um, and I think some of that has been lost. But what this dialogue was primarily about was about the somewhat fascinating idea that if we thought about this hard enough, we could come up with one master conceptual model that we could apply to all organizational contexts. And the early works of people like von Bertel and Kenneth Boulding, you probably <coughs> recognize from, um, from, the, from the Spaceship Earth uh, show and concept. Um, and they were concerned, they spent an awful lot of time thinking through, well, if we exhaustively think about all the levels of human organization we can think of, then we have a sort of a model that takes us from the cell to the organ to the organism to the community, to the country, to the nation state, and beyond. And the idea here was that once we, once we sort of think hard enough, draw all these ideas together, write down what the actual definition of a system is, then that's it, we've done it, and that we've, we've achieved the task of science, and we can use this general model to understand all social and environmental contexts for time ad infinitum, which of course is not the case. But what's important for sociologists is that this strain of thinking um, in many ways indirectly, but in some important ways directly, uh, had a very significant bearing 
uh, on the formative systems theory uh, in sociology, most particularly around the work of Talcott Parsons. Um, Parsons doesn't spend a whole lot of time, um, despite the titles of his work, actually articulating or engaging with, um, at a deep ontological level, the concept of system. He articulates what he thinks are the essential features of a system, of course, and what the essential relations of a system are. But crucially, he doesn't discuss anything about physical environment. But what sociologists at this time are more interested in is the idea that the final stage or the most, the highest level of development a science can achieve is when it achieves what he calls this, the status of its systemic theory. Once a science achieves sort of a generalized sort of set of concepts like the standard model in physics nearly. And this was, in, in a sense, this intellectual climate framed the work of Parsons and the people that came after him um, for many, many years. And its influence continues to be felt today in social theory in many ways. And I would suggest particularly in some strains of environmental sociology. Um, and again, a lot of this earlier work was concerned with things like causal explanation and future state prediction. The idea here was that if we know how a system behaves, if we know how, what the laws of human population reproduction are, if we know what the laws of social change are, if we can define, like, say, Walt Rostow in the 1940s or 50s, what the process, the ideal process of industrialization is, we can simply map all these variables together and predict what human society will look like in 30, 40 years. Now, granted, this mode of thinking was always a marginal strain in social theory, but its influence was profound. You need to look no further than the Club of Rome and the limits to growth um, to that, which is still debated and talked about today. And then laterally, there was a very serious concern with what they call the generalization of behavioral laws. So that once we understood what the components were, the idea was, well, these all kind of interact in the same way. Societies kind of basically function along the same parameters. There's differences in <coughs> respect to place and time, but the essential features of a society are more or less the same. So if we fast forward a couple of decades um, into the 1980s, we start to see a general critique of this approach emerging. And this doesn't start within sociology. It starts predominantly within economics with people like Brian Arthur, who start to take quite a close look at the standard models um, in neoclassical economics. And they suggest that, well, if we map what we think we know about how the world behaves, about how economic and social systems evolve, onto what we observe. <coughs> and again, the context in which Arthur is talking about um, is in the 1980s, where there's significant social unrest um, around the industrial labor forces in the UK and, and the United States. Um, there's significant institutional change in the form of the emergence of neoliberalism. Um, and while he doesn't talk about this, it influences his thinking in many ways, because he says that, well, we have these general laws that suggest that the world evolves in one, in one way. And if we apply this model, if we were to take this model and apply it to the society that we see around us today, does this help us make sense of the world around us? And his answer definitively was no, it doesn't, and for a couple of important reasons. Um, most simply being is that the social world is complex, but crucially complex in a way that natural or biological systems are not. And this is Arthur's key point. He says that while we might think we can sort of conceptualize natural systems um, in a way that gives us an exhaustive knowledge or a predicted capacity, he says, and he uses the term, the term uh, homeostasis, not homeostasis, sorry, um, autopiasis. He says, societies have a unique capacity for self-reflection and for self-adjustment. And now some of this gets into the sort of crazy areas around sort of group mentality and spontaneous adjustment. But the essential point is that he says that there is an unpredictability in social systems because we are people, because we are social people. We form societies and group behavior is complex. And because of that inherent complexity, that's fundamentally different to the way the natural world works. We cannot apply the same sort of thinking around prediction and generalizing and laws, coming up with laws of society that we think we can, that we think we can with nature. Around this time as well, a lot of these different sort of concepts and analogies like chaos, complexity, the butterfly effect start to seep their way, um, start to seep their way into social theory. And the butterfly effect is an interesting one because I think the sort of the, Popular understanding, this would have been my understanding, of course, until I came across Arthur's work. Um, the, sort of the common sense understanding of this was that, okay, small, small effects or sort of small actions have large, have large consequences. And it's really interesting where the story came from, uh, because originally when Lawrence was working on this, um, he was actually working on a weather simulation. Um, and don't ask me to explain that I have no idea how weather simulations work. But I have some notion that at least they feed parameters into it, they run simulations, and you get a, a probabilistic scenario from it. But interestingly, Lawrence left his weather simulation 
one day um, and accidentally moved a decimal point in one of the input conditions. Came back after the thing had run over 50 iterations and seen that suddenly the prediction, the, the most likely prediction that had come before was now not the one, was not the one that appeared on this, on this model. So it's an analogy, of course, that I think it's not too problematic to say that yes, small actions can have large consequences. But the more important point is about the predictability of complex, of complex systems and the capacity for small changes in initial system states to amplify over time. From this, we get the basic, the basic generalization of Arthur, which is that societies are complex. They're constantly in a state of change. There are so many different aspects and facets that contribute to social change, political systems, economic systems, kinship systems, and so on, that we can't possibly predict along the same lines. And so in the middle of this sort of intellectual climate comes the concept of resilience. And this starts around the 1970s. Now, they don't have a monopoly or trademark on the term, of course, but it's most commonly associated with CS or Buzz Holling, as he was done, um, with a very famous paper in 1973. And I think the really interesting thing about revisiting the concept of resilience um, from a sociological point of view is that you discover that, well, actually, what human ecologists were discussing around that time were exactly the same issues that sociologists, social theorists were discussing uh, in the 1970s. They were looking in quite significant critical detail at the, at the standard models of their discipline and saying that, well, all of these assumptions that we had about how societies operate, whether they tend towards optimal states or equilibrium or so on, they're sort of breaking down in the face of empirical data. And in the middle of this intellectual climate then comes uh, C.S. Holling and others with a critique of what they called engineering resilience. So up until this time, this is a gross simplification, but um, I think it's a good way of illustrating it. Up until that time, um, what practitioners were primarily concerned with, and this is from Holling's paper, he uses um, the analogy of the cup and ball. On the top here, we have what he calls the classical approach. So if you can imagine, if you can imagine this state here sort of as an ideal typical representation of a society, okay? So here's your society, it exists here in this, and here's where all the behaviours and interactions and complexity is going on. And here we have a tendency towards a different state. We have a stressor or we have something that's affecting the ability of the, so of the society to persist or reproduce. So it's highly abstract, I'm sorry, but the basic point from this is that in the classical sort of engineering resilience approach, what they were concerned with was well, when a society encounters a disturbance like this, how long does it take for that society to revert back to its original its original state. Um, while that's quite a simplistic sort of conclusion, the implications from this are enormous. Okay? If you apply this to the level of a society or a social system, the implication is that, well, there's nothing inherently wrong with given social relations. Okay? Whether or not the society is capitalist, whether it's deeply unequal, whether there are significant international inequalities, domestic inequalities, whether the economy is primarily geared towards producing cigarettes and automatic weapons, doesn't matter. It's just the return time. And what matters is that we return to the original conditions. So in a sense, sociologists automatically have a significant issue with this because one of the greatest debates at the moment um, with regards to climate is that our, is our current social configuration or is our current mode of production the, most, the best, the most sustainable one to lead to human flourishing and prospering in the next 100 or so on years. So along comes this alternative approach, which is the ecological resilience approach. And instead of saying, okay, what is the time? How long does it take the society to revert? The question that Holling and his colleagues asked was, how much disturbance can a society of any given makeup endure before it undergoes what they called a regime shift? Okay, how much stress can the society take before things are impacted so much, so extensively, that that society changes? Now, there's a, a lot to be talked about there about what change means. Does it mean collapse? Does it mean... And again, most of you who read in this area will be familiar with there's a whole literature on catastrophism, which basically says we're, you know, we're totally screwed and spend a lot of time think, thinking about it and theorizing it. And, um, well, that's all. I'll say no more about that. Um, so this, the real sort of, the new addition here, if you like, in the ecological resilience approach is this idea of the regime shift. So societies don't have to persist. They don't have to collapse. It's not a binary. You exist, you don't. But they can change. So the focus shifts fundamentally away from, okay, how quickly do we get things back to where they are? To, well, what, are, what is the makeup or what does, what does the society that is able to persist look like? What kinds of institutions does it have? What kinds of social relations of production does it have? Is it unequal? Is it not unequal? 
Does it have a certain type of economy, one versus the other, and so on? So, although there's an awful lot to this, there's an awful lot within the ecological resilience approach, there's a couple of basic sort of concepts that come out of this that I think kind of summarize what the approach is all about, and I think are useful for us as social scientists. The first one is this notion of system identity. For a very, very long time, sociologists talked about social structure. And we still talk about social structure. And I think there's nothing wrong with talking about social structure. And I think there's nothing wrong with talking about, not universals, but things that are remarkably historically stable, like gender, like class, like race, and so on. But the problem is that when we start talking about structure as sort of a fixed, immutable quantity, or worse than sort of the high modernist sense that, so we've become modern, we've become capitalist, and now social development is over, as we heard a lot about in the early 2000s. This is a much more sort of localized and, I hate to use the word, nuanced approach to social structure, which they term system identity. Instead of talking about structures, we take the society as it is at any given point in time, whether it's a community, a country, a nation, and so on, and we describe what the parameters or what the properties of that society are, and it's that which makes up the society's identity. What kind of legal system does it have? What's its demography? How is human reproduction carried on? What are the dominant economic activities within that society? What does this international trading structure look like? The second concept then linked to this is what they call adaptive capacity. So the idea here is that once we know sort of what the different, what the institutional makeup of the system is, we ask the question then, to what extent do these institutions allow the society to absorb disturbances in a way that allows the society to reproduce itself? So again, there's all sorts of questions in there about what do we mean by reproduction? Do we mean the population replacing itself every X number of years? Do we mean the persistence of current social relations over a given or fixed period of time? Do we mean the temperature remaining the same or increasing by a minute amount over 40, 50, 60 years? And so the sort of the main shift then in this approach is a very, very deep emphasis on the institutional makeup of a society? What are the different parameters and features of that society at that given point in time? Again, remembering that societies are always in a constant state of change that allow it or don't allow it to absorb or process or process change. And again, this goes back to the fundamental difference of the ecological resilience approach, which is that we're not just looking to measure how quickly a society recovers. We're looking at the conditions in the makeup of the society itself that might allow for a more sustainable, sustainable future. The third one is really important, and it's what's variously referred to as panarchy, or multiscalar effects. And the concept of panarchy simply means that, to an ecological resilience practitioner, societies are complex, okay, that's a given, but they're also hierarchical. Okay, now what they mean when they talk about hierarchies in this sense, is that you have many different types of hierarchy in any given society or any given social system. You have a local context, people live in places, they have an immediate environment, but they might also be subject to a local government, a national government, transnational governance. They're bounded by, in many cases, an environment for something like air quality over which they have no control, by climate, and so on, and things like that. And when you introduce all of this sort of, this hierarchy into the mix, you get what they call cross-scale interactions. And what that means is, and what makes it incredibly difficult, in a sense, to, when we talk about sort of managing ecosystems, you know, the tendency there within the literature is to say that, well, if we only think hard enough, we can come up with a set of rules to impose on people that will give them an ideal state of production. If we pull all our expert knowledge and so on, we can come up with sets of rules that will allow that society to persist and reproduce sustainably. We know from the literature that that's not always, that's not always the case. There are different ways of governance. There's common pool governance, so there's systems where people make their own rules. There's common or civil law-based systems where governments make rules and regulate. And we know from comparative case studies that it's not a given that either one of those situations is always, is always optimal. It's not always best to make laws. Equally, it's not always best to leave communities to their own devices and so on, under specific conditions, of course. And the idea here is that if you take something like the systems that I would have worked with, the historical agrarian systems, you might, while you might have capacities for change at local level, so a producer system or a smallholder system where individuals wish to, let's say, change production strategies but are constrained either by legal restraints, by landlordism, um, by rent obligations and so on. And this is what I study in 19th century Ireland. Um, that's what you call a cross-scale interaction, is that you have different constraints operating at different levels. 
So in the political economy literature, you hear a lot about this in relation to decision making. So regulation might in theory be good, but it's slow. Okay, regulations take time to process. There's a collaborative process of passing laws. And by the time those are implemented, knowledge has changed, the environment has changed, and they moved on. So that's what they call cross-scale interaction. And then finally, sort of the penultimate component, I guess, of the ecological resilience approach um, is what they call regime shifts. Is that when adaptive capacity fails, when the panarchy or the complexities of all of these different interactions is too much, it affects the system identity to the point where it can't reproduce and you have what's called a regime shift. And again, this was, it might seem trivial, but the idea of sort of reorienting our concepts away from societal collapse towards regime shifts was quite important. Because again, in these early structural systems theory models, people tended to think in terms of binary states. You're stable, you're not stable, society's there, it's not. So the notion of regime allows for sort of a greater degree of complexity in the sense that the society can change. Of course, it can collapse. There's many historical instances of, of societal collapse, some quite abrupt. Um, but the notion of regime adds a layer of complexity to that. It allows us to be a little bit more, there's a the term again, nuanced about how we decide what, what social change is, what the extent of social change is. So my problem, or the problem I spent the last Jesus, 10 years um, looking at, um, is kind of specific to Ireland, but it's general in the sense that we see these problems emerging all over the world at different, at different points in time. Um, there is a body of thinking that says that uh, institutional robustness, so the ability of institutions to respond to distress, um, is enhanced when stakeholders have control over decision making. This comes from uh, thinkers like Eleanor Ostrom, who done a lot of work on, has had previously done a lot of work on common pool resource governance systems. And it's sort of comparative in a sense that she makes the point that, well, we're accustomed to thinking under neoliberal capitalism that regulation and governance is the best way to do things. So in her 1990s book, Governing the Commons, she assembles all of these fascinating case studies about systems that have persisted far longer, it should be said, than any system uh, under capitalist management yet. Um, so she takes the examples of things like Torbel peasant commune systems um, in the Swiss Alps that have survived for over 800 years. Uh, the Ethiopian Cairo doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so on that had survived for decades and decades and centuries in some cases. My question was simply, why was this not the case in Ireland? Uh, and again, accepting the premise that there was indeed extensive uh, communal tenure across Ireland, which again is a contentious question. I suggest there is, but <laughs> that's for another day. Um, why did this not translate uh, into the same robustness that we see? Because my key concern here was that we have, so historically the Irish famine have been treated as sort of a natural break. Okay, certainly in the earlier literatures in famine. We have this catastrophic incident. Um, there were sort of institutional precursors to it. There were political responses that could have been taken, but ultimately, it was naturally determined. Now again, the majority of social scientists won't accept it, a couple accept it, don't subscribe to that idea. Um, so my question simply was why? When we have presumably these instances um, of districts that were managed in the system, why did that not translate into greater, into greater resilience? So I look in particular um, at these high distress areas over here in the west of Ireland. So there's a strong sort of, when we look at this, um, when we map this, there's a very sort of strong spatial signature to the areas that suffered the worst in the areas that suffered the least. So again, I talked about outcomes at the start. Um, we could have looked at this in many ways. We could have looked at mortality, but we can't because we don't have data on it. We could have looked at population change. We could have looked at economic, well, some measures of economic output. In this one, we're looking at where were the areas where ration uptake was the worst, because we do have pretty decent and rel reasonably reliable, re reliable data on this. And the second component of that then was to explain that, well, what was the sort of the spatial environmental geographical context of this as well and to what extent did sort of environment and society interact in this way and sort of the basic problem that i kept coming back to was kind of the one that i illustrated at the start which was that our common our dominant understanding of how this actually happened is based on a very sort of a finite notion of how the system works once you have sort of a critical mass of population and once you add in uh, a high concentration of biomass, the potato, with very low species diversity. Um, once you add all of these factors together, then you get inevitably famine and whatever you want to call it, societal collapse, regime shift. But as we can see from this, this is not universally the case. So I found the concept of resilience quite useful to me because again, resilience ultimately talks about the fact that, well, there can be different experiences of distress depending on the makeup of the system in question. And so my question then became, well, what were the characteristics of the social systems in these areas versus these areas. 
that led to this different or differential distribution uh, of distress. So the concept of resilience was useful for me, not just in the sense that, okay, well, it's fairly trivial to say, you know, of course, societies don't just collapse and resilience tells us that there's many ways, but fundamentally resilience is also about a, an overall approach to social research. It's about incorporating a qualitative understanding of how societies work, how institutions hang together, what the institutional makeup of a society or a system is, and bringing all of these things together in an explanatory framework. So it's not just about being able to say, well, here's the point of collapse and here's what caused the society to undergo this and so on. Really, the resilience approach has to be taken, has to be taken as a methodology um, rather than just a concept. <coughs> so I spent an awful lot of time kind of thinking through this and some people have attempted this before, a very famous paper by Evan Fraser, um, where he talks about sort of the causation of famines and he refers to the resilience approach. And he says, that, well, we have sort of three critical variables in the socioeconomic system. We have what he calls down here on this axis, diversity, we have biomass, and we have connectivity. And so Fraser's approach says that basically once we reach sort of the peaks of all of these, all of these three conditions, which we do in 19th century Ireland. So he says, okay, here we have a situation where species diversity has become very low. You have a, a situation where a population has come to subsist on a very, very narrow species subset and a very, very narrow foodstuff, um, predominantly the potato and also a very limited uh, subset of, of variants of potato. We also have high biomass. So we have population explosion with high subdivision, which again means more direct producers, more biomass. And again, this is a way of incorporating the ecological as well, because now it becomes about the relationship between sort of the social structure and, um, and the ecological properties of that social structure. So as a result of population, um, as a result of a reduction in diversity, we have the situation here. And then when we add to this, this connectivity, the fact that population density increases, the populations are pushed to margins and everly increasing in subdivided and dense land, we have high connectivity. So when things are highly connected, when biomass is high and when diversity is low, Fraser says that these are the ideal conditions under which, under which difficulties emerge. Now it's a simplistic model. So what I tried to do then was to look at, well, what are the properties of the society um, that mediate this? So here we have an example where, and again, I was interested in this one particular sort of type of system over here, which was the common pool system or, or the system in which resources are managed collectively. And what the resilience approach sort of demands of you then is that you look, you take a close look at what the structure of that system is, not just in terms of its ecology or its demography, but in terms of, in terms of all of these different features. And again, some of which are cultural, some of which are social, some of which are biological, ecological. And the idea here was that by looking across these two different, or by making comparisons between sort of systems of this type, what common pool systems look like. So they have particular types of tenure, they have certain types of property transmission systems, they engendered subdivision, quite rapid subdivision, and extensive subdivision, sorry. They had fundamentally different legal systems, quite different demographic profiles, as best we know. Um, and again, that's a highly contentious inference that will just partly qualitatively constructed as well. Um, and they have a very distinct morphology. They look different. When you look at them on maps, they look, they're clustered. Um, by comparison, um, other types of system are dispersed. So the key question for me then in making these sorts of comparisons was about looking at, well, when we look at sort of the makeup of the system in this sense, what we're looking at are the different parameters that govern food production. Okay, these societies, they undergo food production. Okay, they're producing, they're direct producers in some sense. And the conditions that govern this then are all of these things like the legal system, like the kinship system, like their demography, like their economic, like their social context. And the question for me then became under the resilience approach is to what extent when we take all of these conditions together, do these conditions allow a society to adapt to the types of disturbance that these people experienced or do they not? And the key issue here is that this is an explanation which is situated in that particular time in that particular context. It doesn't necessarily resort to general laws about population and it requires demands that you take a close look, you qualitatively reconstruct as an ideal type of course what that system actually actually looks like. So in a sense, in a very very general sense, just to sort of back out from this for a moment, is that the resilience approach primarily encourages you to take a step back and not think primarily in terms of just variables. To say that we have laws of human reproduction, we have rising temperature, we have a population effects rates of reproduction and so on. 
but to look at what the makeup of that society is. How does a society organise its labour? What are the decision-making processes within that society, whatever the level of aggregation? And when these are taken together, to what extent do they allow a society to process or to adapt to disturbances in a way that allow it, in a way that allow it to reproduce? So that's the key sort of contribution of the resilience approach, is to get away from this question of just a binary society is collapsed, society is <coughs> done, to saying that, well, of all the possible sort of future states that this society might experience, to what extent does the organisation or the makeup of the society at this point in time allow it, allow it to reproduce successfully or not? And again, that's fundamentally different um, to the old, to the classical sort of engineering approach that went, that went before it. Um, and as I argue, furthermore elsewhere, um, has all sorts of implications as well for um, how we as sociologists think about um, the relationship between society and nature. So on that point, I'm happy to take any questions, open up to discussion and edit out that dodgy comment about Evan Fraser afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and that point there where I um, mentioned it. <laughs> Sorry. Should I? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I'm Helen Shaw, I'm in geography. I'm actually a paleoecologist, so I look at very long-term oh, cool. ecological records. Um, and part of what paleoecology has, uh, has, has started to do over the last few decades is to really look at the interactions between humans and the environment over a long period of time. And we actually have a really long history of farming, going right back to the Neolithic. And, and I think the, the, the kind of, and I accept you're coming from a certain perspective of sociology, but I think perhaps my disappointment is that you, you didn't elaborate more on the ecological side of things. And you kind of said at one point that um, the ecological systems were very simple and you could apply laws to them in a way you couldn't to um, the social system. And I would probably take issue with that because ecological systems are always moving. If we take Darwin's finches in the Galapagos, they, they responded in a way that you couldn't possibly have imagined in advance to different sizes of seeds in the finch population from the mainland went to the, uh, flew to the Galapagos, maybe in a storm or something, and then once they were there, they evolved um, to eat what food was available. So we have, I mean, that's a very small example of how ecosystems shift about and are constantly evolving. And so I think you need to think a lot more about the ecological side of things. And I know Buzz Holland paper really wasn't a social paper, it was an ecological paper and there's been a huge social ecological movement building up since then. Um, so I just wonder if you go back to your potato famine and start looking at the system in more detail and looking at where the, where the problems were worst and what the weather was doing in those areas. The west of Ireland is much wetter, less conducive to potatoes, things like that. The soils um, mm. the interaction of those features of ecology with the populations, that it could move that on. Um, no, I certainly take all your points. And I'm sorry, I smiled at Eamon because you've no idea how much time we spent talking about weather and soil and relief and right. orientation okay. of houses. Okay. But I take, to come back to I think, what, what, one point I do definitely take from you is the way that I presented that sort of that comparison of you know ecological systems being simple and so on. Mm. Um, absolutely not the case, of course. Mm. Um, what I should have said really was that in when I was referring to sort of von Bertelanffy and Boulding, what they were talking a lot about there was um, was with reference to the physical sciences, closed systems, um, and they drew a lot on thermodynamics and they drew a lot on sort of sort, sort of closed engine yeah. engine analogies. Yeah. Um, and the other thing then is that for a very very long time, and there's a whole literature that's going well up to the, the late 1980s. Sociologists spend pretty much no time, but very little time, um, considering the environment. Mm. Um, it was yeah. seen as something external that behaved according to its own laws, and it was there primarily for our you know, for inputs, yeah. and then we sort of exported to it. Yeah. So certainly my understanding of ecology is quite, is quite poor. Um, but I think that's where the panicky model is really good, because you, it's, yeah. not, it's not only that you have a system interacting at various different timescales, but you have various different systems in various different stages of resilience acting on each other backwards and forwards in space and cons that are sort of discipline as well as time. Um, and I think that's where the panicky model can really be, 
used sort of laterally as well as through time to bring in those different aspects. I mean, for example, I've done some work in Ripperstone in North Yorkshire where we looked at um, uh, post medieval environmental change along with farm history change. Um, and uh, we, we sort of we see the reduction in biological diversity go through various steps. And we start in the medieval, which obviously isn't the starting point, really. We could have gone back a lot further. But the medieval is, is totally driven in that area by woolen mills and um, uh, interactions with monks in Italy and the, the wool trade, which is pretty global at that point. And so there's a global system going on, influencing local farmers to do things that are then influencing the environment and changing the environment. And my paleoecology shows a, a, a sort of massive change from a quite diverse bio, um, biological system to one that's just completely dominated by grass. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, you get the breakdown of the social system because the social system in the previous multifunctional biodiverse system had lots of things going on, like people got products from hedgerows, they, they had wood local to the system. And after that, they just became, they, they forgot all of those other bits of the commons that you talk about and just started mm. focusing on sheep. And access to common rights was all about grazing. It was no longer about rights to estovers, wood, or you know other rights that they had. Yeah, so yeah and that's partly why I find the panarchy approach useful, is I mean, Comparing, say, England and Scotland is, is instructive because you have the, obviously the, the more sort of formal enclosure movement. But you also have the same thing in Ireland. And the really interesting thing is that there's, a, there's quite a stark contrast in the extent to which sort of it's formally legislated in England and Scotland, let's say, and then later with, you've got the Highland Clearances, which is reasonably systematic, but in Ireland it's not. And so the idea that you have sort of common processes with different time scales, different mm -hmm. geographies, different horizons, I think is mm -hmm. useful. But again, I, I, my feeling on it was that that's something that you get from the resilience approach to the panarchy concept yeah. that you don't get elsewhere. Mm. Well, thank you. That's really fascinating. Thank you. Can I, ch I can just change the, the focus utterly. <laughs> oh, <please laughs> um, because uh, which uh, it might not be helpful. It might not be helpful. My name is Jane Gray. Um, but you might want to edit this out. Um, it might not be helpful. Um, it depends on what you say. <laughs> yes, exactly. I've recently been involved with a uh, European research project which is was about social resilience. Now it was, I think, framed within the kind of conservative objectives that you talked about at the beginning. You know, can we identify ways to make people responsible for their own well-being rather than having to rely on, on sort of government support? Uh, and it was a, a qualitative research project which was supposed to be looking at household resilience, though in the end it was based on individual mm -hmm. narratives. But I suppose that's just a long way of saying, I mean, obviously we try to familiarise ourselves with some of the literature that you've referred to here, but the biggest challenge we were faced with was trying to identify resilience when we saw it, because there's a sense in which any kind of adaptation, any kind of survival, certainly at the level of individuals or households, potentially could be described as resilience. So yeah. we, we spent a lot of time trying to define, you know, how are we going to how are we going to recognize resilience when we see it? And I mean that thinking about the sort of famine analogy, well obviously you could have more or less deaths. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm really interested in, in, in a comment you made there towards the end about getting away from binary understandings collapse or not collapse. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that. I mean, because you started out with yeah. outcomes being the most important criterion. So how do we identify the outcome for what if we're trying to trying to establish it? I th I think there's a, it's a really important problem because this all sounds great on paper, but at the end of the day we sort of we still practice in a very specific methodological field. And inevitably in my own work I do come back to outcomes. And there does come a point where you have to say, well okay if whatever, if a society is, or if, if a household is whatever, 60% below the median income, then it's in relative poverty. Right, yes. so obviously it's totally arbitrary, but yes. if you don't do that, you don't conduct analysis, yes. you know, and again, we can talk about the meaningfulness of analysis and epistemology, but for, if that's what we're here to do, then you do have to make a decision about what the outcome measure is, yes. and what the parameters are. Um, I think there was, a, there was a, a greater tendency, I think, in the classical literature to talk about collapse as a possibility. Yes. Um, but also to talk about it as simply 
as a measure as an outcome. So you have, and this was again this, uh, partly based on historical sociology as well, was that if you look back at historical incidents of, of societal collapse, well, that's the outcome we should be expecting here if we don't get things right, that you know, society will collapse at some point in the future. But again, there's sort of there's that high theory level of things, and then there's you know the realities of day to day research, which is where I go back to my office and I pull up a, a GIS of <coughs> spatial units, and I have to measure which one is positive, which one is negative. Yes, I suppose um, we made it too complicated for ourselves because we were trying to we had this criterion sort of getting by better than you would otherwise have expected given the disturbance, yeah. but that actually proved to be literally impossible. Well, I felt myself, maybe other colleagues. Uh, we're, we're happier with it, but I felt that that was impossible to identify. Uh, it would have been much easier if we had simply yeah. done what you suggest there and said, had some sort of quantitative measure of what we were going to define. I think it's, it's a really big issue. I mean, you mentioned the, the, res the Resilience Alliance that came right. after that. I mean, that journal, Ecology and Society, is fantastic, but the majority yeah. of papers are conceptual. Yeah. Um, it's very difficult to find... <coughs> There's well, a lot of uh, work on small systems like coastal fishery yeah. systems and things like that. Yeah. So, so yeah, but there is a lot of conceptual yeah. work as well. It, I think this is an issue, this outcomes-based system. We have the same in ecology where we have these kind of European descriptors for certain habitats. And it vows that, you know, if you've got a habitat which is a heathland, it should be, I don't know, 80% heather and 20% <coughs> <coughs> you know, one of the other species or whatever. Um, and they become very prescriptive and their management for biodiversity tends to say, well, you should have that because that's this habitat. But actually, you know, it's much more nuanced than that. And there's a whole rewilding movement around self-willed oh, yeah. land and trying to get more of a balance. And I think this comes back to this idea of resilience. That's been, the way it's been understood in policy terms is very much about resilience as an end state that is good to achieve. Mm. And panicky is not about resilience being an end state. It's being about on a process all the time. And the, um, when you actually look at it, in the panicky model, the resilient state, the one that's really resilient, is the one just before a crash, when mm. things are brittle. Mm. So the system is, is kind of very resilient, but it's, it, it's also quite limited in some ways. And the potato is a good example of that. That was a good yeah. system feeding a lot of people until it went wrong. Mm. And we also have that in upland grasslands, where if you graze, graze more and more sheep, eventually <coughs> it gets taken over by a type of grass which is very resilient to sheep grazing. They don't like it, so they don't eat it. The biodiversity goes down, but the resilience of the system goes up in terms of sheep yeah. grazing. So you get a brittle system which is more likely to lose soil and have erosion in very high levels of rain and things like that. So the systems are always so interlinked, you really need to get to the bottom of those interlinkages, I think. Yeah, so I guess the key issue is that it's really difficult to operationalize. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that it's common to both yes. ecology and social science. Um, <coughs> does anyone have one more question, I think? Do you want to get you out in time for your lunch? Yes, please. So can we take two? <laughs> your first? <Take> three. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure you how our PhD student did cross-disciplinary geography and anthropology PhD. So my research looks at how culture-nature relationships are formed and then the impacts this may have for climate and environmental change. So for my undergrad research I was working on in Shvatham Island and it just struck me looking at the map there that would fall under a high area of black area in the parameters. Um, yeah, the islands are really interesting. Exactly, really cases, interesting. Yeah. But as you probably know, they needed very little input. They uh, demonstrated what we might consider resilience. Very few people died on each of them. Mm. Um, so I'm interested then in the question of transference of resilience. And if you have come across that in the theory or what your thoughts would be on that. Um, particularly now in each of them, the population there is only 168 permanent residents. But it's made up of people who would call themselves islanders, whose history and heritage is there, and people who've recently moved there. And I find talking with people who've moved there, they adapt very much a islander approach to resilience um, in how they live and in how the social structure, I suppose, um, they become a part of becomes almost part of their mindset. It's really interesting. Um, the second thing that struck me then was about the theory that you've been talking about, there seems to always be a separation of society or culture 
from ecology and nature. And have you noticed any shift in that? Um, I know you talked about the shift in the 80s. Have you noticed any shift in perhaps recognising that humans are ecology? Culture is ecology, social is nature, and nature is social. Would you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I know it's a very really, broad question. No, I'll answer really quick. <laughs> the island one is fascinating. And I think if I remember it correctly, the Inish Keys and the Aran Islands also escaped. Mm. And the question of transference is interesting because like, structurally they're quite similar to the mainland. Now, culturally, and I'm not, I think it's perfectly fine to say there is something unique about Ireland, mm. ecology and community and culture. I think that's totally unproblematic. Um, but the, the transference issue was interesting because the implication around the Inish Keys, at least, was that they escaped it because they were distant enough from the shore that it didn't reach them. So in a sense, culturally, institutionally, they were the same. They just happened to be further mm. away. But like you said, in the second point, there is a lurking implication in the resilience literature and in the commonwealth governance literature as well that that community stakeholders essentially have have local knowledge that can't be gained by either outside observation there's a sensitivity to seasonal cycles there is a deep climate knowledge um i mean i have a student recently who mapped um western mayo who looked at sort of the names that people attributed to each minute parcel of land and and that, that that didn't just mean they could identify them but they knew things about their properties and qualities and so you do get, you do certainly get that sort of question of local knowledge is best um, in the common pool resources. <coughs> I don't know how that translates into transference, but it's a really mm. interesting thing I'd be curious about as well. Mm. Um, if that answers all of us. Pater, did you have one? Well, I don't know that I have very much to say really, Pater Kirby. Uh, but I'm struck by the fact that I wrote a book on vulnerability and globalization about uh, 10 or 12 years ago. And after writing the book, uh, uh, when I moved to the eco-village in Clark Jordan, where resilience is a term that's used an awful lot and it was relatively new to me, I suddenly began to say, well, surely resilience is the, is the ability to cope with, 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 um, with vulnerability. Uh, I had sort of used coping mechanisms in the book, <coughs> not just individual coping mechanisms, but also the way systems can develop coping mechanisms. So I'm wondering, could you comment on that? I mean, uh, you haven't mentioned vulnerability. I, I find I, I find this fascinating because it suddenly makes me, uh, uh, you know, have to think through a little bit in, in more complexity where the term comes from and, and how one defines it. Uh, I, I, I'd love to get information on a book. You said you, you published a book on this. But my specific question is, uh, I mean, to, to ask you to comment on, on that observation that can resilience be treated uh, as a term outside a wider context of a response to vulnerabilities. It's when systems come under threat that one begins to, uh, to, to see the need for what might build mm. resilience in the face of those threats. I think if, if, if I've had more time, maybe I should have gone into it, but one of the biggest shifts in the in the sort of complexity term um, was to view disturbance as as inherent. So, <coughs> one, 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 one of the main tenets of sort of classical systems theory was that societies are fine until something from the outside impacts them and knocks them out of knocks them out of kilter. And the resilience approach, as well as some of the other complexity theory approaches, say that well, that's not the case. Societies are always in a case in a, in a state of destabilization. They tend towards destabilization, <coughs> and it's only through sort of temporary institutional adaptation uh, that they become stable mm -hmm. so the the essential argument there is that what we think is stable is actually just transient so mm -hmm. things look fine at the moment but that's history tells us that's temporary and it won't always remain the same so i didn't really mention it partly because it's sort of implicit in the approach itself that there's always disturbance and that any sort of human adaptation is just a temporary fix to cope with that disturbance if you like um, where it appears more formally then is in the notion of adaptive capacity um, and that's it, that's a really fundamental concept because it's <coughs> it takes a sort of axiomatic that societies are always adapting, okay? That there's never an optimal state, and that every sort of adjustment in the makeup of a society and its institutions and so on is an attempt, uh, whether explicit or not, uh, to cope with disturbance, to cope with constant disturbance. So the response was they they can't exist apart because vulnerability is inherently um, a part of the resilience approach, and that derives from. So the earlier critique of classical systems theory. And, um, yeah, um, Josh Moody, I'm a PhD student here. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going way off point here, but bear with me because I kind of think it makes sense. So 
if we're talking about resilience and systems identities as relatively stable, although constantly emergent structures, um, what about the idea of, there has to be an idea of the what the identity or the stasis is. So if we're talking about resilience and coming back to, um, what's it coming back to? And like kind of when we're asking these questions or if we're beginning to use this, what is the point, what is like the starting point? What's the identity? And as it's always constantly emerging and it's highly contested, how how can we think about resilience and like what what sh what are we going back to? And as and as these things move, it changes what it could ever go back to. This is a really abstract no, I don't question. Know, I don't know what you're but um, yeah. I, I was just thinking about it in terms of when, like, when you have the when you had the graph up there, um, in terms of our current like mode of production or society way of organizing society just in a really simplified sense and it's apparent uh in like inadequacy within the limits of what the environment can actually sustain and provide and if we're talking about resilience is resilience trying to manage those limitations uh, those ecological limitations um, to the point where we can get back to where we are at the moment or what, what, what is the, what's the goal I suppose, how's the goal, who defines the goal? Yeah, that's I, a, This is a really awkward question for you to answer but I'm just, it's just more of a thought I suppose. Yeah, I'll just give a short answer if that's okay. I think you've hit on one of the most contested parts of the whole approach today which is this, this idea that is it a conservative concept or a transformative concept? Mm. And the conservative interpretation is, like you said, that things will be fine if we become more capitalist, right? So we contain the destabilization <coughs> by suppressing populism, by ensuring mm. stable government. Um, and I mean, you do see this in literature. You say that, you know, we look at China, for example, because they have such stable government, they have capacity to pass. Well, I'm not agreeing with this, but these are the types of argument you see presented. So within that strain of thought, there's certainly a view that a resilient society is <coughs> one that stays the way it is. And again, that's kind of the engineering resilience approach. But again, it's not because you do see it, particularly when it's individualized, um, you do get this sort of, this dominant mode of thought, which is that, okay, mm -hmm. if, you, if, if, if things stay the same as they are, then all of the different sort of properties of you or properties of the system are things that maintain you the way you are or maintain the society the way, the way it is. Um, as to what we're actually talking about when, you know, what's the state that we want to get to, um, I think if you okay if, first of all if we look historically it's perfectly fine to say there are instances where there has been societal collapse and you can say that you know this society of this type did exist here it doesn't exist today and what happened in the meantime the difficulty is when you start when you start generalizing from that to say that societal collapse is always a result of either whatever population growth as a result of whatever industrialization as a result of whatever so it's sort of a floppy answer in a sense that um, it doesn't just say that these things universally create social disorder and unrest, but it does encourage you to say that, well, first of all, if you're talking about an historical society, what did that society look like? If you were to define it at you know, time A in the 1700s, would it look the same in the 1800s and the 1900s? And so it becomes more about sort of tracking how societies and systems evolve in their composition and in their makeup. And to look along the, the way at those key sort of tipping points, well, what happens at this point if it encounters a disturbance? Does it, does one aspect of the system change to cope with this, or does it change to the extent that we can no longer say it's the same? It's the same system, and this is what they, they mean fundamentally when they talk about regime shifts. Mm -hmm. So a, a regime shift, quite simply, could be a transition from capitalism to eco-socialism. It could be a transition to social democracy. It could be a regression to autocracy. Those are all regime shifts, yeah. and those are all possible futures. Um, but I think the really key issue there that you hit on is the question of whether it's conservative. Does it mean we say the same or does it mean we change? I think change is the fundamental outcome in this approach yeah. at least. Um, and I think I might do I have to end it here. Yeah. Two. Does everyone have to go? Yeah. Sure. One quick question if you don't mind. Okay, just one. It does overlap a little Sorry, can you do you want your hands up first? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, uh, so uh, it was very interesting for me. And um, I'm not a believer. Anthropology department just started with my PhD. So I'm sort of confused with 
one thing that is is this entire approach uh, based on the idea or an assumption of a community like for example i'm also looking at um Reverine islands which sort of after floods they get submerged and you know uh, sorry during floods they get submerged and after floods they sort of again re-emerge right or they don't so but then there are people who are living there now the idea of um, climate change reduced floods and how they are sort of probably adapting to that sort of um, event is interesting because I don't understand if there is a sense of community there. Um, there is a constant shift of people within a matter of few days. And if I'm, I'm trying to understand if I can, if I can sort of uh, examine that, that sort of a space using this sort of an approach. That is, um, how do we understand if uh, the resilient approach um, where there is probably a very fleeting concept, or if I dare to say that there is no concept of a community. So in those sort of ecologies, and, and that, that just, yeah, that's the question. So the question is whether, if you can identify if there's a community yeah, sort of is presence. Yeah, sort or of an approach based on already an assumption that there is a community at the first place, that there is a sense of a community, and this community is responding to it. <coughs> and that will be a, a human community? Yeah, I think there. Are, so it, it it depends really. I mean, most of the case studies that you see from this are, they often refer to them as human coupled ecosystems, um, which is sort of a misnomer. Someone else made the point that you know humans are, you know, ecological components as well. Um, but there is a tendency to sort of treat them somewhat as separate. Um, so you do get the sense in some of the case studies um, that there's a disconnect between sort of the human community, if you like, and the ecological community. So when when, the, when, when case studies appear in sort of the major resilience journals, they're usually about sort of human coupled ecosystems. So there is an ecosystem of X, you talked about coastal communities. And then there's sort of, now let's look at the human population, which has superimposed itself by accident on top of it and study the parameters of that community. Um, so, yes, generally, I would say yes, within this approach at least, um, it, 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 it emerged from a need to conduct sort of better human ecology. So, it is generally and fundamentally about human communities. in ecological space. But again, there's a huge sort of cultural theory debate over to what extent you can make that distinction between humans and nature and so on. And um, then yourself and then Sean. Yeah, want to go first there? It was just a quick response oh, yeah, to this. Sure. Is that Sorry. okay? So it, uh, it was just this thing. I think, I think you have to think about time scales, and this is a really important thing within this resilience. So if these communities are reforming on a seasonal basis, mm -hmm. um, and reforming some kind of structure every time they reform, then you can look at that as a sort of a, a, a nested time scale within this resilience model, that they're reforming constantly. But I also think you need to look at a nested social scale <coughs> in that people usually only move to suboptimal areas when there is either some really pressing economic benefit or they're pushed out of the rest of society by some kind of spatial patterning, you know, overcrowding, class systems, whatever. Um, we have this in upland areas where you see people moving up the uplands as populations expand and then coming back down when populations um, are taking up the better land <coughs> when populations um, uh, retract. So if people are being pushed onto these areas, why are they being pushed onto them? and look at those nested cycles, I think that might be helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And Sean, I, uh, I'll finish. Sean Sh uh, visiting scholar here at uh, the Department of Sociology. A uh, really interesting presentation. Thanks, Thanks for that one. Uh, just Thanks, a, a quick question, I guess, is uh, I'm working in community food systems myself, uh, an activist as well as a scholar. And I, I'm wondering how we can maybe translate some of these concepts uh, into, in, into practices for, for activists, for example. Um, into a framework for them to think about where they're going. I, I can recognise some tendencies within ecological activism from 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 the the uh, Buzz Hollings model, for example. Um, but I suppose part of that might be a normative framework. But that's maybe something I'm not getting a big, uh, a big sense of from the presentation. So, uh, is there room for a normative framework within this model, for example, in relation to human flourishing? 
uh, in relation to ecological uh, biodiversity, for example. Are these elements that, that, that can come within the framework, or, or for you, is, is it a more detached analytical uh, process of just watching systems change uh, without necessarily getting involved in, in, in directing that change or, or envisioning uh, potentially mm -hmm. positive changes? I think in, in, the, in the narrow sense in which I presented it, there's not a lot of activist emphasis and there's no connection with social movements. Um, where you do get this much better is in the eco-Marxist literature. Um, so that would be Bellamy Foster and others who, um, um, who do develop sort of practical guidelines out of that. So you've got um, um, in the literature on say the metabolic rift, you've got the stuff about urban agriculture and um, there's some good papers by people like Becky Clausen and say Cuban raised bed urban agriculture. And within that, they don't involve the concept of resilience, but they do talk about this sort of as an anathema to marketize food production and so on. The problem with this, again, is another issue with this, is that it is quite socially conservative. The end, but there's very little political systems are talked about in terms of variables. So you can have different types of political system, but it's just a measure. We don't really care what political relations exist. Um, and again, another issue of it partly is the scale of which a lot of this stuff works on. It's geared primarily towards sort of local level community level case studies. Um, the population is sort of superimposed and the properties of the population aren't interesting politically. But the sense of that is that, you know, the real, the sense in which you're talking about, I think a lot of that comes better from the more macro level literatures on sort of political organization, political relations, comparative political economy is a good one. But also the eco-Marxist one I think is fundamentally, um, it's a macro theory at the heart of it, essentially. And it doesn't just deal with localized case studies. It can but it's not the primary focus. So I think within the eco-Marxist literature as well, you get sort of very powerful concepts to understand sort of the impact of industrialization on food production systems and so on. And within that, there's certainly scope for looking at um, the experience of communities in terms of resilience, but I think it's a much more effective avenue for politics in that sense than, than this literature, which is much more conservative. Okay. So I think we better, so, I'm really sorry, we better well, close I just, it off. Well, Eamon Slater here. I'd just like to thank all the contributions and especially uh, from our, our key speakers today. You know, as Mark says, the beginnings are always the hardest thing to do. But today, it looks so easy in your, in your talk and the response from here. And uh, just to say that we go again on the 5th of December. Uh, Paddy Bresnahan from the Department of Geography um, will be talking on the title is called Water, the relative, that's the exact title he gave me, and it will be talking about community water schemes and his project that he's doing in conceptualizing the social and the ecological aspect of water um, here. So it's on the fifth, same place, same time, and hopefully, and he'll all join us. Unlike me, Paddy has actually done research in the present day, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll be able to tell you something useful. So.